This is the Champions Rugby Show. I'm Martin Hindley. Get ready to hear from a defining figure of English rugby with a trophy cabinet to reflect his status. And Lawrence Bruno, Nero Delalio, what a name, what a player. Big man, big trophy, big personality. He won what is now the Heineken Champions Cup twice with his beloved Wasps, as well as claiming five Premiership titles. He was a World Cup winner with England, and he's transferred all of that class to television, speaking about the game we love since he retired in 2008. Joining me today, I'm delighted to say, is a sporting icon, the former England and Wasps number eight, Lawrence Delalio. Lawrence, thank you so much for coming on the, the Champions Rugby Show. How are you doing these days? Yeah, my absolute pleasure. I mean, obviously, uh, times are um, a little bit strange and, and unprecedented, but um, jumped at the opportunity to come talk about a tournament that I and my colleagues and peers have got such fond memories of. I mean, outside of, of, of a World Cup, it's, you know, for me, it's probably the the greatest rugby tournament on uh, on earth, certainly uh, in terms of how hard it is to win. Um, you know, I've been lucky enough to to be involved in a, in a, in a few World Cups and, and to have won a World Cup. And probably just behind the World Cup, I, I genuinely believe it's the hardest tournament in rugby to win. You know, I had many glorious failures as well. So uh, to get to uh, two finals and to get over the line with uh, some uh, wonderful colleagues and, and, uh, and playing partners um, was, was truly spectacular. It's a strange time for, for all sports right now. Do you think we'll all start to, to value the presence of sport in our life even more once we get back towards what we used to call normal? Well, un undoubtedly. I mean, uh, you know, the old adage of uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder, you know, is never truer than it, than it is right now. You know, you don't know until you have it taken away what it really means. And you, there's certainly been enough time for all of us to to reflect. For many of us, that's that's been about reflecting and, and looking back at the past um, and perhaps remembering, as we are today, uh, some former glories, some former great tournaments. There's obviously nothing to, to dwell on in the present. And we just hope that, you know, we can look to a future. And of course, there will be sport back, uh, live sport, let's hope, across all sports and all levels as soon as possible. And undoubtedly, you know, that sport will will be changed now for the future, you know, whether it's the way it's played, the way it's viewed, the way it's seen in broadcast and all we can do is is learn the lessons from from what we're experiencing right now take on board the recommendations um and to ensure that when sport does come back to our pitches and our, our consciousness and our tv screens all over the world that it's a it's a better sport and a better product than uh, than it's ever been before and and there's no doubt that you know rugby particularly is is a sport that relies so heavily on social interaction not just on the field in terms of the the camaraderie and the contacts and the, the nature of the sport, but also off the field as well. You know, the, some of our fondest memories are, are gained from, from standing shoulder to shoulder with fans of the same team, opposition team. So, you know, the, it, it's a sport that relies on that social interaction. And I'm sure when it eventually comes back in whatever guise that might be, uh, it's going to be celebrated beyond belief. Now you have the chance to look back on, on your incredible career. How would you describe yourself as a rugby player and I guess as a sportsman as well? I've been very lucky in, in the sense and, and lucky would be one way of describing it. I mean, you obviously you know create your own luck. There's an enormous amount of hard work that goes into that. But I just think from a timing perspective, I, I was a player that, that came late to rugby. I, I love sports and I didn't always envisage that I would end up playing rugby particularly and Professional rugby was was a long way away from my sort of thinking as a young man. Let's not lie about it. You know, everyone wants to be a professional footballer when they grow up, and then when they realise they're not very good at football, they end up playing rugby. And um, and then if uh, if they can't catch, then they get put in a boat and they end up rowing. So uh, I did tell Steve Redgrave that he wasn't terribly appreciative of that particular <laughs> analogy. But uh, no, I came late to rugby, and and I joined Wasps. Uh, luckily, uh, you know, in the in, in those days, you know, you join one club and you tended to stay there. And it was the most extraordinary journey, you know, 18 years at, at one club uh, from 1990 to 2008. Just to cut to the quick, uh, you know, I had a very I had five years of, of amateur rugby and then 13 glorious years as, as a professional. And, and to be a, alongside my, my mates and my pioneers, to be one of the kind of um, the people that, that sort of took the first steps into the professional era, if you like. You know, no one really back then knew what they were doing. Um, how many hours do you train a day? You know, what does a 
what does a professional rugby player's timetable look like on and off the field? So, you know, we were pioneers in that sense. And, it, and there was a, a lot that we took from the from the fabric of the old amateur era, all the good stuff that was there. And then, you know, we had the opportunity to set some real standards in the professional era. And uh, it's it's a great sport. And, and, and as I said, I, I was lucky enough to go on that journey right from um, seven aside rugby. I played in the world, first Rugby World Cup sevens through to, um, you know, the Heineken Champions Cup uh, at its inception when the English clubs, you know, did join the party and and see that tournament grow and grow and grow. And and obviously the international stage as well. So I can't complain, I'll be honest with you. When you when you look back, I gave it as, as good as I could. I've got some fabulous memories from my rugby career. Um, one or two that were disappointing as well, but that's inevitable in life. And I certainly put everything I had, both heart and soul, into um, into what I can look back on with uh, with great pleasure as a rugby career. When Rob Andrew and Dean Ryan left the club, you became Wasps club captain around about the time when uh, the Heineken Cup came into being, especially, as you mentioned, when the English clubs were involved in 96-97, in which was a very special season for you at, uh, at Wasps with the, the premiership success. I mean, when it came to Europe, what were you making of of the tournament back then? I mean, what did you think that it might become? Well, I think it was something very different. You know, rugby in the early days was terribly simple. Um, in the Courage League, as was, and then became the Premiership, you know, there was no home and away fixtures. It was just uh, home or away. So you played maybe 10 teams or nine teams uh, once a season. And then on top of that, there was maybe four international matches and and a handful of regional games, divisional games, as they were known then. So, uh, it, rugby had a very simple look to it. And then all of a sudden, you know, someone came up with the idea that we should play each other home and away. So that, again, um, you know, gave perhaps a, a more of a level playing field to to fixtures and, and overnight almost doubled the number of, of domestic fixtures. And then, of course, the natural progression, as we saw in other sports like football with the, with the you know, what became the Champions League. Was to was to play each other across the borders in in the um, you know when I first started playing for, for for Wasps when they were based in London you know we on the eve of every uh, international fixture we would have a an Anglo Welsh fixture against um, a Welsh team and then if we were playing if England were playing France there'd be a an Anglo French fixture against one of the the French club sides so I guess it was kind of happening you know without people realizing um, you know Wasps would play Racing on a Friday night before England France. You know, my debut, I think, was against Neath on a Friday night down at the Knoll uh, before Wales, England. I mean, that was some introduction to rugby, let me tell you. Uh, so uh, I think those things were happening. So I think the natural progression was to see this birth of, of this wonderful, um, you know, European Champions Cup tournament, which I can't believe is now this year celebrating its 25th anniversary. And, uh, look, it, you know, for me, it, it was it was a, the next step, really, to, to get those, um, you know, those wonderful European rivalries. And I know that, you know, Toulouse were the sort of uh, the early pace setters in Europe. They had that wonderful philosophy. They were probably ahead of their time in many ways. Um, and they were certainly the team that everyone aspired to, the real Madrid, if you like, of the rugby world. And it's great to see them uh, on the 25th anniversary, them back in, back at the top table, you know, dining, you know, royally right where they belong. So, uh, yeah, an extraordinary journey. And uh, as I said, outside of Test rugby, and even at times, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll reflect on some of those club games. They were as big as, as any test match I've played in ever. Um, and I still rank my own uh, good fortune of being involved in leading Wasps to the um, Heineken European Cup final and, and success against Toulouse as, as right up there with, uh, with anything to do with international rugby, including the World Cup. You mentioned about leading there. Um, you were relatively young, even though you were experienced when you became club captain. Who were your motivations? Who were your inspirations as a leader, not just at the start, but the leader that you were to become over a long period of time for, for Wasps? I mean, the, the captaincy was thrust on me at a very early age. Um, I think I was about 20, in my early 20s at the time. And, and you know, I'd, I'd served an apprenticeship, you know, growing up in the youth section of the club and the under-19s, the under-21s. I'd, I'd played in the first team with, uh, with with those, you know, great players around you, the likes of uh, of Rob Andrew, Jeff Probin, Dean Ryan, you know, Rob Rozovsky, all these players who'd played, you know, at full international level. And I think you, you learn an, an awful lot from from the experience of those players around you. Um, and then, you know, when I got the captaincy of Wasps, I, I think I was quite quick to acknowledge that um, I was suddenly captaining a lot of players who were 
vastly more experienced than I was and significantly older than I was. And I think it's important that when you do lead, particularly a team sport like rugby, that you don't feel that all the pressure is on you to, um, you know, to make all those decisions. You know, you've got to lean on the on the experience and the and the uh, streetwise sort of uh, attitude of many of the other players, particularly those who who are much much older. You know, there there are those in a rugby team that want a voice and, and want to make a, a contribution in terms of the leadership group, and there are those that are very comfortable just um, just doing what others ask them to do. And I think uh, you've got to be able to dial up the ones that want a voice and, and dial down perhaps the ones that don't. So uh, I learned I learn a lot, an awful lot. And first and foremost, we're in a results-driven business. It's about getting the right outcome on a Saturday. And uh, I think that's the fundamentally the biggest learn that I had at rugby is, is you know, we can have a lot of fun all week, but ultimately um, your mood, your, your attitude, the fans, the... The, you know everything to do with the club is ultimately determined by what happens on a Saturday uh, or in more modern times on a Friday night Saturday or Sunday uh, but uh, you know it, it is a results driven business and I think uh, you know it's it takes time to build a lasting success and a lasting legacy um, and I think that's the key you know Europe particularly was always a challenge in the early days we had a young team young age profile you know even way back in 1996 you know because wasps and, and a lot of other rugby clubs you know, were driven through their academy system. You know, I was a product of the academy, as were a number of the players that went on to achieve European success. So ultimately, that success doesn't always happen overnight. You know, we we had several years of fruitless Heineken European Cup campaigns where we'd learned some painful lessons, you know, losing away from home, losing at home to breathe in a, in the quarterfinal of... Uh, of, of a competition that they went on to win, I think, uh, ultimately. Um, you know, that was a painful lesson for us. Um, some humbling defeats at Thoman Park in uh, against the likes of Munster. Some tough, often brutal games in, in, in the south of France. You know, to, to, get a, uh, to get a win in the south of France in club rugby was a collector's item, certainly back in the, uh, in the 90s and the noughties. So, uh, yeah, some, some interesting lessons for us all to learn. But, uh, you know, ultimately, we started to to build some success really from from about sort of 1999 onwards that started domestically with our own Tetley's bit of cup or uh, as it was known then we then you know got some domestic league success as well and then finally you know the summit of of rugby the uh, the, the European Champions Cup was was within our grasp that season 2003-4, what a side that you that you were leading that season in particular. And um, what a semi-final. Um, you mentioned some humbling moments against Munster, but that must have made it all the more satisfying to win at Lansdowne Road in the way that you did in the semi-finals with the, the last gasp try. Your recollections of, of that? Well, first of all, it was an amazing season, which, you know, for some of us, myself being fortunate enough, started with the World Cup at the beginning of the season. So when you start a season... By winning the World Cup, <laughs> it's uh, you sort of think That's to yourself, not bad. How, how can how can it get any better after that? And I remember coming home and Warren Gatland, who was our coach of WAS at the time, and Sean Edwards, you know, they they said, look, you know, they they embraced England's success. Uh, they were very proud to have made significant contributions to that success. They gave us a week off, and then um, said, look, you know, you need to well one sober up, and two, um, we need to get you back training again. And we played Perpignan in in a, in a group game, and we won that. and And our journey through through that particular Heineken Cup was was, was extraordinary. You know, we had to go away to Perpignan in the final pool match, um, which was in a real bear pit of an of, of an atmosphere, eighteen and a half thousand of their fans. And we weren't sure who we were going to draw in the in the quarter final. We had to win the game. We ended up winning it. Uh, quite comfortably, got a standing ovation as we left the field in Perpignan and we, we drew Gloucester in the quarterfinals, uh, which was a home quarterfinal. Again, statistically such an important factor in the Heineken Champions Cup. We uh, dispatched Gloucester relatively easily in the quarterfinal and then set up what was a, a very famous now fixture against Munster. And, and to go away in a, in a Heineken Cup semi-final is, um, is a, tough, a tough ask. To go away to Ireland to play in their national stadium against a provincial side like Munster was, was incredible. And, uh, and as I said, goes down as one of those great historic games. It, the significance of which wasn't lost on, on myself and the squad, particularly with Warren Gatland having coached Ireland and having felt that perhaps he left Ireland under somewhat of a slightly controversial cloud. So there was a lot right resting on it personally, um, a great respect for Munster. They were, were the side that were coming of their age in terms of the European Champions Cup. They'd suffered a lot of their own inglorious defeats um, at the hands of other opponents. But uh, yeah, it was an extraordinary build-up to the game. 
we had about 200 traveling fans. I think they had about 55,000 uh, all wearing red shirts. I've never in my life to this day walked out into a stadium where the atmosphere has been as red hot as that day was. I mean, you know, apart from the fact the weather was was uh, was was blistering anyway. I mean, literally, I walked out and there were with the team, and there was fifty five thousand red shirts, quite simply. And um, you know, it was us against the entire Munster nation, really. And we, you know, we were significantly pumped up, and it, it was a classic game, and it goes down as a classic. You know, not because of the results, but because of the attitude that both sides had towards playing. You know, semi finals aren't supposed to be necessarily games that that people remember because um you know they can be quite scrappy quite nervy affairs with such a big prize like the European Cup final at stake but from the minute one you know both teams went at it you know we had a a real positive attitude to go and play and how often do you get a semi-final where the score changed hands I don't know half a dozen times at least where there was four yellow cards two on, on on both sides there was tries on both sides I mean the drama every single moment uh, was resting on it and of course you know with 10 minutes to go we were staring down the barrel I think we were about 12 points down and we found found it within ourselves to, to, to level the game and then and then Trevor Leota got you know got the crucial try at the end so uh, yeah fantastic atmosphere and for that reason you know I remember the the graciousness of the Munster fans I mean they must have been heartbroken after the game another failure at the uh, at the penultimate hurdle. Uh, and yet they were so gracious because uh, it was just one of those games that you had to applaud both sides, both sets of fans, because when the, the music stopped right at the end, you know, Wasps on this occasion were lucky enough to be ahead. And now one from Wasps. And Voice is going again. King Leota. Did he get it down? <laughs> Time out. Has he scored the biggest try in his career? Sorry, I did not get that. Just say one word. Thank you. I said I think it's the best Heineken Cup game I've ever seen. Scratch that. It is. Wasps are being simply magnificent against a magnificent fighting team from Ireland. Was it intimidating to then come up against Toulouse, given the the stature that they had in European rugby already at, at that time? I mean, they, they've added a couple of of titles since in Europe, but they were the holders. Even though you were at Twickenham, was there anything intimidating about coming up against against a side like Toulouse back then? I mean, if you could pick one opponent to play in your first European Cup final, no disrespect. I mean, nowadays it might be a Leinster or a Saracens, but certainly in those days uh, it was definitely Toulouse. They were the aristocrats of of uh, French rugby. They, as I said, they were the Galacticos. They always had the stars. And for us, it was a dream final. It was, uh, you know, to play Toulouse um, and also to play them at Twickenham, a stadium that we were starting to to really get to grips with. Obviously, it was a stadium that I knew very well, but uh, Wasps had, had been there a number of times as well. And I think, as I said, when you had these experiences of the Heineken Cup and you've been to Perpignan and you've, and you've come away with, a, with an emphatic win and you've been to Lansdowne Road and, and played... Uh, Munster and you've come away I think that gave us the belief that doesn't matter where we are or who we're going to play we've got the ability to win this you know win this competition and and we were also English champions at the time you know we'd won the the Parker Penn as it was known Challenge Cup the year before so we'd we'd won a European final albeit against Bath we were English champions and we did that emphatically at Twickenham so less than 12 months ago we'd, we'd won the our first premiership playoff title against Gloucester. So I think we went into the game with huge respect for Toulouse, obviously because of their pedigree, but also in the knowledge that that their record was amazing in France, but outside of France, particularly in England, they their record in England was not good. I think they'd won two games out of about 15 or 16. So uh, I think we went in there with a lot of confidence and a real belief. And I think that's the key that we could um, that we could win the game. Sport is a lot of a lot of the time about emotion. So I'm going to give you a couple of names now and and ask you what um, what emotion it, it brings back. The first one is Clément Poitrenaud, and the second one is Rob Howley. How did you feel at that moment? Well, I mean, they were a worthy side. I mean, somehow we were chasing shadows in the first half. Let's be very clear. And uh, the better team were to lose by some distance, but the better team on the scoreboard were Wasps, and I think we were, we were very clinical. Uh, we'd only been in there half a couple of times, but we'd made sure that we came away with points. Uh, we went down the tunnel at half time and we sat and we were, no one said a word for about three minutes in the changing room because, um, well, no one could. They were too busy breathing. But uh, we were, we knew we were up against a very worthy opponent. We then got the first try of the second half, that wonderful you know, length of the field effort by Mark Van Gisbergen. 
So make no doubt, you know, we, we were clinical when we had to. But uh, as they started to make the changes off their bench, which was um, as good as anyone's starting 15, we started to creak a little bit defensively and their momentum built throughout the game. El Atal playing at number nine. And then the, the scores were level. Um, and yet again, we still had that belief to dig deep, scramble our defence. And the moment of the of the game and, and probably one of the moments of uh, of European Cup history now and folklore was, was the Rob Howley kick. You know, and it was a shot to nothing. We were just conscious with the scores level just to try and keep them pinned down in their own half and we might get a penalty or an opportunity to get a drop goal or something. And and obviously, Rob chased that lost cause. And, and you know, I, I mean, to this day, I don't know what Poitrano was thinking. I mean, at the time, your heart went out to, to him. But actually, he, he was a magnificent player that went on to have the most stellar career. So uh, from a Wasp fan's point of view, we you wouldn't begrudge our moment in the sun. And... Uh, for Rob Howley to chase that lost cause and, and to come out with a with a score that was so dramatic. 80 minutes means 80 minutes on the clock. Remember, and Howley is going down the line. Oh, oh. my goodness! Howley! What has happened there? To he comes to sleep. To sleep. Quattrono can't believe it. Robin Howley may have snatched the European Cup. What has Quattrono done? He's waiting for the ball to go. Howley will not give the cause up. It is, quite frankly, one of the most incredible moments that this competition has ever seen. Clement Poitrino will feel the exact opposite to how Robert Howley feels now. The fates and the gods were, were shining on Wasps that season. You know, we had a decision that, uh, in, in Lansdowne Road for Trevor Leota's try that could have easily been a 50-50 call and gone the other way. And we had a, a similar decision that, that, that was undoubtedly a try. So, uh, you know, sometimes your name's written on the trophy and it certainly felt with that moment of magic from Howley and a moment of horror, I guess, from poor old Poitrano that, uh, that our name was definitely on the trophy. I heard a speech in Newcastle at the 2019 Heineken Champions Cup final uh, last season from Mrs. De Carvalho Heineken. It was the first time that she presented the trophy in 2004 and she presented it to you. And I know that you uh, you ran into one another uh, back in Newcastle. Do you still remember the feeling of, of getting your hands on the trophy for the first time? Yeah, I do. I mean, listen, it was a very special moment for, for all of us because you've got to remember we were Was uh, for all its history, long history, it's a very humble club, you know, that comes from very humble beginnings. Even then, dare I say it, it was a bit of a David v Goliath, you know, us against Toulouse. You know, we had a we had a total squad um, salary bill of about three million pounds. And I think theirs was probably something around 15 to 20 million euros at the time. So just in terms of the size of the squads, the teams, the internationals, it was it was a huge Herculean effort, I think, by Was. And I, and I think to climb the summit of European rugby is, you know, truly special. It's, a, it's as I said, the hardest competition in the world to win behind a, a, a Rugby World Cup. And it, and it felt very, very special. And as I said, to be handed the trophy by the young daughter was, was amazing. I think she must have been a, a closet Wasp fan or something. But uh, we bumped into each other for many, many years. And, uh, you know, it, I love the fact that she, her being given the opportunity to, uh, to present the trophy still, still is an endearing image in her own mind. Um, certainly for us and for all Wasp fans and, uh, and was, you know, and, and, and many neutrals as well, because the tournament had produced some special moments that year, as it, as it often does. And, um, you know, I've subsequently found myself drawn to a, a particular team, you know, when, when you just get a feeling about them in that year. And, uh, you know, as I said, the year of 2003-04 was, was a great feeling for, for Wasp fans. They have conquered Europe. They can now say they are the best team in the Northern Hemisphere. London Wasps, the Heineken Cup champions. How did it compare three years later, the squad and the experiences when you prevailed back at Twickenham again against rivals Leicester? Well, again, you know, the, the gods were shining on us because, uh, you know, to, to, to have a, another European final, as fate would have it, back at Twickenham. I mean, I think, you know, when you talk to European Cup winners, they'll all, they'll all say something different, maybe. But for a lot of us, the first one is very special for, for lots of reasons because you know it's it's an opportunity to to take your club into into uncharted territory really to to get your first European star on the shirt and on the you know and on up on the uh, up on the cup. So for that reason alone, I think the Toulouse final will will always be the probably the the slightly more special one. 
because it also it was against the uh, the European absolute super giants at the time, super heavyweights to lose. Second time round was was still a huge effort from all of us. You know, ch- slight changes in personnel, and uh, and also we, you know, I was very proud because English rugby, the Premiership's often been maligned as 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 being, you know, certainly in the early days of of opening the doors to um, you know to many foreign superstars and you know, to varying degrees of success. But Wasp was built on something that was much deeper than that. You know, 13 out of 15 of the team that played in 2007 European Cup final were English. You know, and that's a pretty high percentage. You know, we had, ironically, the two players who weren't English were the two players that scored the try that day. <laughs> <laughs> Owen Redding, who, of course, went on to great success with Leinster after being at Wasps, and, and Rafael Ibanez, who... Uh, Deserve to be a European champion with uh, with Wasps, but uh, yeah, I mean it was it was special in a different way. It had much more of a different feel to it. It was a, an all England final against a a foe that we kind of knew so so well. We played them so many times at Twickenham in uh, in the Premiership final. In fact, we played them two years before in two thousand and five in Martin Johnson's last game, and and we were to play them again at Twickenham um, a year later in the in the 2008 final which was my last game so so there's not undoubtedly it had a slightly different feel about it than um, than the one in 04 but equally you know you've got to go out there and win it and uh, again we were the underdogs we were up against the team that were going for the treble they'd all Leicester Tigers had already won the Anglo Welsh trophy they'd already won the English premiership the week before we were the only team stopping them from from uh, completing a unique treble. So in many ways, uh, we were the kind of party poopers, if you like, the underdog yet again. And, and I guess that played to our advantage. We seemed to revel in that role um, of being being seen as the underdogs. And again, we, we, were, we absolutely knew that we were capable of winning the game. It was, you know, we had Ian McGeekin at the helm at the time with, with Leon Holden, the, the New Zealand coach. And, uh, and we did it in a slightly different way to what we'd done before. So, uh, it was special because, as we all know, to win it once, you know, people can argue that the stars happen to align. If you win it twice in the space of um, three or four years, having also claimed, you know, several domestic trophies and back-to-back seasons, etc., I think one can start to talk about some sort of mini dynasty, really. They are who they are because of their never-say-die attitude. But this is it. London Watts have ended their season with the highest accolade that club rugby in this part of the world can offer and in doing so they deny Leicester the treble what have you enjoyed most about your coverage of the the Heineken Champions Cup in your role uh, on television these days I mean is it one thing that makes you frustrated that you're not out there or are you enjoying seeing the game from from the media perspective oh no listen I'm I'm as well one it's outside of um a rugby world cup it's the greatest rugby tournament in the world both as a player and as a and as a supporter and as a a fan which is what i am now of rugby even though i'm covering it in the media it brings the very best players some of the very best players in the world together in uh, in some of the biggest stadiums on the biggest stages of all so i think that's what makes it truly unique and you know obviously as a player i've got very fond memories but as a uh, as a broadcaster um some of the atmospheres that i've been lucky enough to witness some of the uh, matches that I've been fortunate enough to call um, as a commentator and to see the joy that it brings to to players and fans and administrators alike. You know, when you've when you've been there and you know that feeling of of lifting that trophy and how hard it is to get there and the journey it takes. I think when 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 you see other people share that journey and and have those emotions and those feelings that you felt many, many years ago, you kind of it's something to be shared. You know, it's uh, it's just a tournament that that is so hard in its nature to win because of the structure. You know, you start the tournament in October and you finish it in May and everything happens in between, you know, so you've got to keep it, you've got to keep the show on the road for the entire season. So, uh, as I said, it's taken me to, uh, taking me all over Europe, some wonderful performances and and it's the fans as well because rugby is uh, is about celebrating difference and our difference is what brings us all together. And you couldn't ask for anything more diverse than the Heineken Champions Cup, you know, in terms of its clash of styles, of cultures, of, of all sorts of different things. And uh, that's something that I think we should celebrate in rugby and we should cherish. 
Lawrence, finally from me, you're, you're one of the tournament's great leaders through its history over, over 25 years. And now you're translating that leadership off the field into your work with different rugby organisations and, and charities as well. Tell us a little bit more about uh, about what you're working on at the moment with those. Well, I just felt that, you know, rugby has given me an enormous amount throughout my whole life. And when I retired in 2008, I wanted to give something back. I think with a degree of success, comes uh, a certain degree of responsibility. So I set up my own charity, Rugby Works. There are numerous charities across the uh, sport and particularly the rugby space, but I chose um, to work in a space which was not really being developed with young, vulnerable, disadvantaged young people throughout the United Kingdom, and really to use rugby as a way of helping them to to change their perspective, to change their lives, to give them a sense of self-esteem, to really use the, the values of our great game to get their lives back on track. And uh, I'm very proud to have invested a huge amount of time and effort into Rugby Works, um, which now works in um, some 80 schools around the country, specifically working with young people who have been permanently excluded from mainstream education because uh, no young person is born bad. They just don't necessarily have the support system and the network that uh, the rest of us have been lucky enough and fortunate enough to to have had. So uh, rugby's got this way of... of uh, of grasping young people and and making them think a bit differently about their lives. So, uh, as I said, it's something which uh, I've only just started, only really scratching the surface. Uh, There's lots of more young people that need our help and our support in the same way as perhaps I did when I was sort of 14, 15, 16 and and questioning quite a lot of what was going on in my life as a teenager. So, uh, yeah, Delalio Rugby Works uh, is something I'm uh, I'm very proud to have uh, set up and, and continue to drive forward. Well, we look forward to seeing the the outcomes and I'm sure if they're half as good as they they have been on the field, then there's going to be a lot of young disadvantaged children who are going to benefit from from that. Lawrence, thank you so much for sharing your story in the Heineken Cup and now also in the Heineken Champions Cup with your TV work. Thank you so much for your time and we look forward to seeing uh, seeing more and hearing more from you in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Wow, didn't time fly there with England and Wasps legend Lawrence Delalio. So many great recollections from not just the tournament, but also from his career to enjoy right here with us on the Champions Rugby Show podcast. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you're not subscribers already, then why don't you join the gang and become one? And if you liked it, well, don't hesitate to leave us a nice review as well. We've got some more European legends coming up shortly to share their stories from a quarter of a century of what is now the Heineken Champions Cup. So we hope to have your company then. But until then, from me and from all the team, goodbye.